Okay, so hopefully everyone can start seeing my screen. So first of all, welcome to everyone join that's joined us this evening for our March Genomics Light, which is titled Exploring Cancer Genetics in Focus. And we're joined on the call with two of um, cosmic uh, scientists from uh, Zoe and Leone, and we'll get to hear a little bit more about them uh, in just a second, but a few house rules just to start. Um, so our events aim to uh, help everyone explore the science of genomics. Um, so just want to say that uh, for everybody to be respectful of all different points of views that are raised during uh, tonight's call, um, the platform is being moderated. Um, so we just want it to be a nice, friendly event for everyone. Um, you will see on the webinar, you should see three buttons. Uh, you should see a chat function, a closed caption function, and a Q&A function. Um, so throughout the day, uh, this event, you'll uh, be using a few of those. So the chat is a uh, button that allows you to interact with the panel, and there'll be a few questions where we'll get you to, to do that tonight. Uh, the closed captions allows you to uh, create sort of a display text of all of the um, what's being said to, tonight. And then the Q&A function, if you've got a question that you'd like to pose to one of our panelists today, um, if you want to put the, your, any of your questions there, and feel free to put them throughout the talk that we have, um, make sure that you don't lose that question that maybe is, uh, comes to mind, and then we'll make sure that we get to it um, at the different Q&A points during, during that, that time. Uh, this is where we're coming from today. Uh, so we are based on the Welcome Genome Campus, this lovely, I think this was taken in the summer by the looks of the crops, but this lovely sunny campus um, that is comprised of uh, quite a lot of different organizations. So the Welcome Sanger Institute, uh, EMBL, EBI, and you'll hear about another organization that's based uh, on our campus in just a second. Um, so I just want to say welcome to you all from wherever you are in the world today, and it's lovely to, to have you with us. Um, so yeah, as I said at the start, this, this talk is um, called Exploring Cancer Genetics, and we've got Zoe and Leone with us today. Um, we'll be finished around about 5.30, and there'll be plenty of opportunity to ask lots of questions. Um, the session is being recorded, and post the event, it will be available on our YouTube um, so yeah, make sure if there's at any point you need to drop out, there will also be a recording. So um, we'll be able to share that at some point as well. So that is everything from me. So I will stop sharing and start by uh, getting to know Zoe and Leone away from, uh, I guess, their work. And before we get into the real meat of, uh, of what you guys do on, on our campus. So, um, why don't I start off by uh, asking Zoe to introduce yourself and just give um, a little bit of background about how you uh, ended up uh, where you are today. Yes, so I'm Zoe Shid. Um, I'm quite early on in my career, so I'll keep this short and sweet. But uh, so last year I was doing my master's in biochemistry at the University of Bristol. And having graduated, I wanted to pursue a career that um, was still within a scientific environment uh, that didn't involve wet lab work as, although I enjoyed it, I preferred a bit more social interaction, <laughs> a bit more communication. And that's sort of where I came across this role as the relationship officer for the cosmic team. Um, and within my role, um, there's a number of parts to it, but I guess the main part is to act as the first point of contact for both our commercial and our academic users, and also to liaise with our commercial distribution partner. And then I guess a bit about what I do in my free time. So I've recently taken up swimming. Um, I'm not notoriously a good swimmer, so it's a bit of a learning curve for me, um, but that's something I'm looking to improve at the moment. Super. Thank you, Zoe. And uh, Leonie, over to, to you just to introduce yourself. Hi, so I'm Leonie and similar to Zoe, I am quite early on in my career, but um, my undergrad was in medical genetics and I switched things up a little bit by doing forensic genetics for my master's. Um, following on from that, I worked for a little while in a saga sequencing lab, um, but that was mainly because I had no idea what I wanted to do. 
I knew that I wanted to work in genetics, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And I figured that the best way for me to work that out would be to put myself right in the mix of things and just basically see who was working around me. So I got really interested in the scientific marketing and communication side of things. And that's what I do now. I'm the scientific communications officer. So essentially, my job is what your typical marketing and communications person does, but making sure that it's scientifically accurate and making sure that our users have the information that they need to make sure they can kind of use our data to its full potential. Um, Outside of work, I think I spend most of my time in a dance studio. Um, I absolutely love it. I've been going since I was about two or three years old. Um, I've managed to find a ballet class since moving to Cambridge recently, but I am looking to kind of get back into some of the other styles as well a bit more soon. Super, thank you. And I believe both of you share a a little bit of a love for for dance, if I'm I'm correct. Yeah, so yeah, I also have danced from quite a young age, um, ballet as well, and tap, modern and ballroom, but I haven't yet found a class within my area. I know yeah. Lee only goes to one in Cambridge, but I don't yet have a car. So maybe once I've got that, then I could join. <laughs> and uh, just in terms of your time uh, with us on the Welcome Genome Campus, it's been around about six months. Is that right for you both? Relatively, as you say, fairly quite new. What's it been like since um, since you joined? How, how have you found it? Um, uh, I've absolutely, yeah. I've absolutely loved it. Um, Obviously, working in genetics, you're very aware of the Welcome Sanger Institute all throughout your education. And it was amazing to kind of get the job here. And it's so strange sometimes when you're talking about certain things within your career um, that were big, big developments, like world changing developments in the industry that you work in. And you're referring to the people who made those developments as your colleagues is kind of like, quite baffling at times um but yeah everyone's been so welcoming and so easy to get along with but it was nice Zoe and I started on the exact same day actually so it was quite nice to have someone else to kind of get used to everything with yeah I would agree with that seeing the newbies thrown into an environment where everyone around us has many years of experience it was a really good learning opportunity Super. Yeah, that's well, that's really nice to hear. Um, well, I, I, if anyone has any questions just about um, both Zoe's and Leonie's sort of career path, feel free to put them into the, the Q&A button uh, now. Um, we can we can have a, a small uh, pause um, just to answer any questions on that side of things. If not, then we'll, we'll start moving into the actually what what you what you guys are, mm-hmm. are working on at the moment. Um, I guess one question from me is. What do you think has been the the skill that you didn't realize that you you sort of are using right now that that is something that you use every day? I think it's the adapting my communication style to the different people I speak to, and that's something I'm still developing, but um talking to different users like across the globe and in different industries it's it's been a big learning curve. And Leonie, how about yourself? Um, it's a tough one. I'd say kind of um, presenting skills in themselves. It's one of those things that um, you do a lot throughout school, throughout university and things like that. And unless you're going into a research career where you do end up presenting your work, um, you can't often visualise the context in which you're actually going to be presenting at any time. But um, Zoe and I have pretty different roles. and even other people within the company, our scientists, our curators and people like that are constantly presenting to, like Zoe said, a vast range of audiences. So being able to kind of pull together slides and present and things like that, I think that surprised me how much you use that in the real world. Great. Well, talking about presentation <laughs> and those skills, I will have to... see if I maintain this. <laughs> um, to, um, yeah, just tell us a little bit more about um, the organisation you work for and what that actually uh, means. So I'll hand over to, to both of you. Mm-hmm. Just share my screen.
Okay. Yeah, so thank you for everyone who did join the call today. I know it's Thursday afternoon. Um, but as we mentioned, both Leonie and I are from the COSMIC team, and COSMIC stands for the Catalogue of Somatic Mutations in Cancer. And COSMIC is the world's largest cancer genomics database. And we are based within the Biodata Innovation Center or the BIC building which is on the Welcome Genome Campus in Cambridge. And throughout this presentation, we hope to highlight the main goal of our company and also the importance of COSMIC within the cancer research community. We also hope, hope to highlight the range of career pathways you can follow, which utilize a scientific background. So some of you may have come across these terms before, but just to catch everyone up to speed, I'd like to go through two key definitions. So first of all, what is a mutation? Well, a mutation is a change in the DNA sequence of an organism, and it usually is one of three things. Uh, it can be beneficial if it gives a survival advantage to the organism. It could be harmful, or it could be silent if it has no effect on the organism. And if a mutation occurs, or a number of mutations, that drive uh, cell proliferation, so cell growth, cell division, uh, then this can result in a disease known as cancer. And the sort of textbook definition of cancer is a disease in which cells divide out of control to form a tumour or a mass of cells. OK, so we've looked into what cancer is. So what does COSMIC specifically do? So COSMIC is an associate research programme underneath the Wellcome Sanger Institute, which in itself is a non-profit genomics research institute. And COSMIC stands for the Catalogue of Somatic Mutations in Cancer. So we, know, we do know there's one word in that that some people might not be familiar with. So to define somatic mutations, there are mutations that occur after conception and in any other cell than gametes. Gametes meaning sex cells, so your sperm and your egg cells. And the best way to summarise what COSMIC does is that it's the one-stop shop for everything from which genes are known to have a causal link to cancer to whether or not there's treatments available to treat certain cancers. So we've got our first question. So we're going to see, can you guess, when do you think the first case of cancer was recorded? Great, and I'll just put up the poll as well um, for everybody to vote on this. So if I launch that now. So we've got 3000 BC, the 900s or the 1800s. Uh, so I'll give everybody just a few minutes. Um, to answer the question. So I'll share the results shortly, but at the moment um, we've got a strong favorite, um, but the others, are, uh, it's got a few votes separately. So I'll just end the poll now. Share the results. So we've got 64% say 3000 BC, 12% say the 900s, and 24% say, percent say the 1800s. Um, so I will stop sharing and hand back over to you two to tell us what the right answer is. So you're all very switched on. It is 3000 BC. Although I noticed we put answer C and it's answer A, but you get the message. <laughs> Um, so the first case of cancer uh, was recorded in Egypt in an Egyptian textbook on trauma surgery. Um, and the Edwin Smith virus containing this information is shown on the right there. Um, and these cases were identified as ulcers of the breast. And these ulcers were removed with a tool referred to as the fire drill. Um, but what I wanted to mention here is that the terms cancer and tumour were not yet used. So why are we talking about all the way back to 3000 BC? So we're not expecting you to read this whole timeline, but what we were aiming to draw attention to was how it took us from 3000 BC to around about the 1900s to really see any progression at all in cancer research. And then from then on, we've seen an absolute snowball effect in the amount of data we've been getting back. So from the 1970s, when we had the first oncogene, which is a cancer driving gene discovered, 
to the Human Genome Project launched in, 10, in 1990. From there, it took 10 years to complete just one human genome. So that's to gather all of the genetic information from just one human being. And in only 20 years from that achievement, we've gone to a point now where Illumina makes machines called the Novasec X series that can sequence 20,000 whole genomes a year for just $200 each. So over time, the genomic data that became available increased exponentially, and we needed a way to record this data in an accessible format. Um, and this is where the Cosmic Database became crucial. But the thing is, once Cosmic was created, that snowball effect didn't stop. We've continued on that trajectory and we're still discovering cancer data at an alarming rate. You can see just from 2004 to now how much more data we have. So the question is, how do we do it and what is this data that we're recording? So you may be wondering how the data gets recorded within the database. Um, and at the heart of what allows our Cosmic database to grow is our curation team. And these curators extract data from a variety of sources, including published cancer genomics literature, and they then record this data within the database in an accessible form. Um, our cosmic curators are experts in their field, and you can see two of our curators there, Alex and Denise, on the screen. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight here is that curation is a scientific role without any wet lab work. So to access our data that our curators pull together, you might start at our cancer browser. Many researchers focus on a single form of cancer for their entire careers because there is just that much detail to discover. And this is where we're going to start today. So Cosmic provides data that's extremely specific to the location and the cancer type. And once you've done that, here's the kind of data that you can discover. So at the highest level is our cancer gene census, and this essentially is a catalogue of genes with evidence of a causal role in cancer. And the CGC, or the cancer gene census, gathers all cancer-related data for a specific gene in one place, and it's continually updated when new evidence comes to light. And then each of the CGC genes are split into either tier one or tier two genes. So tier one genes are those that are documented to have an active relevant role in cancer and there is evidence of mutation of this gene driving cancer. Whilst tier two genes are generally more recent targets where the body of evidence is still being explored. Um, and so our CGC genes can be categorized using the hallmarks of cancer. And the hallmarks of cancer describes how tier one CGC genes contribute to cancer development. And these hallmarks define 10 capabilities that human cells acquire or suppress during the development of tumours. OK, so we're on to our next question. So you can see here, this is how the hallmarks appear on the Cosmic website, but I've covered up their names. So can you guess which of these is not a hallmark of cancer? So we've got A, which is escaping programmed cell death. B, formation of new blood vessels, and C, abnormal protein production. So again, I'll just post that poll for everyone. So we just give a, yeah, give everyone a couple of minutes just to fill that poll, the, the poll out, and we'll find out what the answer I'm seeing a lot more of a, a split uh, in this one. Okay, so I will end the poll quickly now and share the results. So we've got 22% say escaping programmed cell death, 47% uh, say formation of new blood vessels, and 31% percent to say abnormal protein production. So over to you two to tell us the right answer. The eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed that we had a, a bit of a jump to the next slide there, but we still had quite a split in answers. So the answer was C, um, abnormal protein production isn't in the 10 hallmarks of cancer. So I've uncovered the 10 hallmarks there, and for some of them, they may not be too 
obvious what they actually mean. So I've put some kind of simplified descriptions on the side, but the 10 hallmarks of cancer that we record in COSMIC are proliferative signaling, suppression of growth, escaping immune response to cancer, cell replicative immortality, tumor promoting inflammation, invasion in metastasis, angiogenesis, genome instability and mutations, escaping program cell death and change of cellular genetics, which is quite the tongue twister, hence why I've given the more kind of friendly description of a few of the more unfamiliar words. Uh, so then if you want to do a more in-depth analysis of a specific gene, you can look at uh, specific mutations within the cancer mutation sensor. Um, and this classifies mutations as either driver mutations, where they're shown to cause cancer, or passengers which do not drive cancer. Then these mutations are ranked on their likelihood of being functionally relevant in cancer. And like with the CGC genes, these mutations are then categorized into tiers based on a number of factors. Um, but you might be wondering how these mutations arise, and this links to our next product, mutational signatures. Yeah, so if you wanted to look a bit more in depth at these mutations themselves, mutational signatures are a way of identifying the most common cancer-causing mutations that occur as a result of specific factors. So it's a way of assessing how frequently certain bases are replaced by others within the genome. So you may know that um, DNA is comprised of the four bases, T, C, G, and A. And this is basically a way of assessing how frequently, say, a C is replaced by a G, a T, or an A. So these frequencies are unique to different cancer-causing factors that can be both internal and external, hence on the name signatures, because they leave a signature-like mark. So this is a type out your answer type of question. We want to see if you can guess what could cause one of these characteristic damages to the DNA that leads to cancer. So yeah, if everybody wants to put um, their answer in the chat um, button, um, then we'll uh, see what um, is coming out. So we've got a few people already um, saying UV radiation. Um, smoking as well, aging, a couple more UV radiation, virus is another one that's coming out as well. Yeah, we're getting some great answers coming through. I think people have understood quite quickly that what I'm essentially asking is what can cause cancer? So exactly right, things like smoking and UV light are perfect answers. And it makes me wonder if someone might be quite familiar with um, with mutational signatures because UV radiation was the first one to come up. And actually, the, the mutational signature you're looking at on screen right now is the one for UV light. And for anyone that might have been curious, the one that was on the last slide was actually the one for smoking, or at least the chemicals found in tobacco smoke. So on to Cosmic 3D. Cosmic 3D is a tool that allows researchers to look at a 3D model of the protein that is the result of a cancer-related gene. So why is this necessary? DNA is like a little instruction manual for making proteins. So proteins have a very specific job in the body. And if you damage the DNA, you damage the protein. So Cosmic 3D helps them to predict the exact effect of this damage. And that in itself is useful in a kind of like drug development context. So it helps it, it helps people to predict exactly where to target with treatment. Um, so of course, a cancer diagnosis can be a very scary time, but I just want to say that it's not all doom and gloom and that continued research is being carried out across the globe to try and find new therapies and drugs that target a specific uh, patient's cancer mutation, uh, so-called precision oncology. Um, but we need a way to record and to track the progress of drug trials and any current drugs that are available. Um, and this information is recorded within our actionability resource, uh, which curates the current state of 
precision oncology. So with all of this in mind, which professions do you think use our data? So again, if uh, everybody wants to write um, who, who you think is accessing um, this data into the chat, that would be great. Um, and then we'll go through. So we've got um, some people saying pharmaceutical, yeah. NHS, um, PhD students, medical researchers, doctors, oncologists, drug yeah, development teams. Good. Yeah. Um, the government as well. Interesting one. <laughs> uh, bioinformaticians. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, super. R and D scientists. That's yeah, nice. Yeah, that's an yeah. interesting one. Cool. So yeah, if you want to go through. Yeah, it seems like everyone has quite a good idea of who might use our database. And mm. um, so if I go on to the next. Um, yes. Yeah, so our user base is quite broad, um, but at the highest level, it can be split up into commercial customers and also academic or as we call them non-commercial users. Um, so for a bit of context, uh, we are a not-for-profit organization. And although we sit within the Wellcome Sanger Institute, we don't receive funding from the Wellcome Trust. Uh, so we re rely on a licensing model whereby commercial customers pay for a license. And this allows them to access the data. Um, and then we can use the revenue from this uh, to continue to grow Cosmic and allow our academic audiences or our non-commercial audiences to access the data for free. And as you can see by the pie chart on the right there, our user base is spread across the globe. So we briefly mentioned our curators, but we thought we'd go a little bit more into detail about how we gather this data and create this database for the people that Zoe have just mentioned to use. So it all starts off with the curators. Like we said, they extract, record, and standardize the data. It's important that these are human beings and not computers and AI, because there are just some types of data that AI cannot curate. Scientists have a habit of sometimes saving tables as images instead of actually accessible tables. And that's where our curators come in, because only humans can really read those at the moment. So then once we have this data, it comes over to our science team. They seek new scientific opportunities and come up with new ideas, such as new tools that make sure that we stay up to date in this very quickly changing industry. Then once we have these new ideas, they go over to our project management team. And these make sure that we accomplish the goals by coordinating these really large scale projects. And then once we've put together how these projects are going to be achieved, it's up to our IT team to action them. These are the people that do the coding and the website building and make sure the user experience is the best it possibly can be. Once we've done all of this, we've now got this new tool, we've got this amazing data and it's been put on the website. It's up to people like myself and Zoe to make sure that people know how to use it. So I'm part of the comms team. So my job is to make sure that our users have the right tools and the right knowledge to be able to make the most of our data and use it to its full potential. And our business team, which includes Zoe, their job is to search for and seize opportunities so we can ensure the long-term sustainability of our database. So why am I telling you all of this? Every role that I just mentioned in the last slide is a scientific career, but none of us ever step foot in the lab. And yet we use science every single day. Sometimes our day job looks like this. Our job is to make sure that the job that the lab scientists do is accessible to all of the people that need it, that can really make the difference in the world with things like drugs and treatments. So to conclude, what is COSMIC? COSMIC is the world's largest database of somatic mutations in cancer, and it's used by a vast range of scientists. And why do we need this data? It helps cancer researchers conduct their science faster with easy to understand, streamlined and high quality data. And what jobs does it create? It creates a vast range of jobs in science, but completely outside of the lab. So thank you for listening. And do we have any more questions? Great, thank you. Uh, 
uh, yeah, need for that. So we're on to our um, Q&A uh, section of the evening. So if you have any questions for Zoe and Leonie um, and about what you've heard today, uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A uh, button and then we'll, we'll get them to we'll sort of pass those, those through and have a chat about them. I guess you sort of started to touch upon it, uh, Leonie. I have a have a question to start us off. I guess um, is what so you you said about sort of what your your day job sort of looks like. Um, so how do you? What are the different ways that you sort of as um, a sort of a communications person are you trying to interact with um, different audiences? How do you use? What are you using to interact with people? So, of course, it varies per kind of audience that we're trying to reach. We spend a lot of time at the moment trying to reach PhD students, which that honestly looks like um, hopping on social media. So I manage our socials, such as our Twitter and our LinkedIn and our YouTube channel. Um, we try and reach as many audiences as possible by doing things like this, our presentations. But it also means interviewing the people that have used our data. And that's one of the parts of the job that I enjoy the most because... Very often we have these scientists that have produced this completely brand new um, information and we get to be the first people that get to find out about it and interview them and learn how um, our data is being used so we can improve it in the future. A little um, self-plug here, but Cosmic has recently put together a podcast called Conversations with Cosmic where you get to hear some of these interviews that myself and my manager, Rebecca, get to hold. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe just if you have a moment, uh, what we can do is, um, if I, I think I can share that with everyone. Um, so oh, Leonie, you. maybe if you, if you put that in the chat to me, I can then share that with everyone. And then, yeah, we can make sure we, we share that podcast. Um, don't mind a little self plug there. That's all right. <laughs> um, and Zoe, I guess um, for yourself as a relationship officer, um, maybe just going through what what that looks like again on on a, on a sort of daily basis. What you mentioned, sort of talking with global participants and global users. Um, I saw that that pie chart had um, quite a lot of people in um, uh, quite a lot of users in America and all across the, the globe. So yeah, just yeah. It's a little bit more about what that what, as a relationship officer, what are you actually uh, doing? Yeah. So I should mention that that pie chart I showed was based just on our commercial user mm -hmm. base. So a lot of the our commercial users are based in North America, um, and it can include big pharmaceuticals and clinical diagnostics. But my sort of role is to be a sort of first layer of contact for any of our users, uh, particularly our commercial users, if they have any questions about how to license or where they need to go to license um, and having some of those initial conversations with people that are looking to access the database, but they're not quite sure if it's for them, for example, or uh, how the licensing model works. Um, yeah, and then also using LinkedIn to try and find uh, potential new opportunities of commercial companies who may want to access the database. Um, so yeah, I guess relations management is sort of what it is. <laughs> yeah, great. And so we've got a few questions just coming through, so I'll just go through them as well. Um, I'm just posting the uh, podcast to everyone, so hopefully you should receive that. Um, and then I'll get to the some of the questions. So. Um, Someone has asked, is there any good and easy tutorials about Cosmic that you potentially would recommend for someone to learn a little bit more about the database? Um, yeah, so actually we've got a YouTube channel which has some um, tutorials on there and we're currently trying to put out updated ones. So we, the first one's already there. It was only released, I think it's only last week or the week before. And I can't tell you how good these uh, tutorials are they include like live demos from our expert curators and I'm someone who didn't know how to actually move through our files until I saw this tutorial and 
now I've got this tutorial, I can stop pestering our scientists for information for me to post on the socials. And I'm actually completely able to go and just find it myself. So yeah, our YouTube channel is the best place to go for that. I would also say that there was a, there was a webinar you did a while back, wasn't there? Mm -hmm. only with some of the science team and that sort of a run through quickly of how to use each of the tools. Um, I will try and find the link. But <laughs> Yeah, we do try and host kind of webinars and take part, especially with the EBI. Um, we try and take part in webinars as much as we can um, to do kind of live demos and things. Oh, Hello, sorry, did I go there? Yeah, <laughs> just this, yes, I do not for long. <laughs> um, yes, internet, as always, uh, proving the not is as reliable mm -hmm. as one would hope. Um, I think I was saying, are both the webinar and the YouTube, uh, are, are both those on the YouTube channel, is that correct? The webinar as well? Is that somewhere um, else? I don't think the webinar is on our own YouTube channel. Um, you'll definitely be able to find it on our social media. Okay, cool. Well, we'll we'll make sure we uh, after the event as well share any of the those links uh, again as well. Um, just moving through on um, uh, the uh, just the questions. So someone has asked, are there any interesting examples that you could give of recent advancements in say cancer treatments that have arisen as as a result of cosmic or where someone might be able to see some of that that information around cosmic um leonie i don't know if you want to speak about one of the podcast ones you've done recently um perhaps um, the melanoma one yeah so treatments specifically i'm struggling to think of a one off the top of my head but in terms of um cosmic use in kind of like cancer research and things like that um, you may have seen in the media this research that's come out where they've proved that the UV lights that are used in nail salons to cure acrylic and gel nail polish are linked to melanoma cancer and cosmic was used in the research that um, proved that. Um, also, we've got things like, um, believe it or not, our human data is also being used to help progress canine cancer research so helping cancer patients who are dogs which has been really interesting to hear all about um but yeah that that's the kind of thing so essentially um it's the mutational signatures tool that was used to help prove that uv light because if we know the mutations that uv light kind of causes that relates to cancer then the test that they did in the lab was essentially, okay, so we expose these cells to the UV light that's in these nail polish dryers or curers, I guess. Do they get the same mutations that Cosmic says that UV light gives to cancer patients? Yes or no? And yeah, that's the research they did and inclusive evidence. And you said that was on one of the podcast episodes as well. Yes, so, yeah. it was our most recent one, actually. Okay, so yeah, another another plug. Um, oh, actually, I don't know if that was out yet. It's or, <laughs> suspense for the future. The, well, the canine one is. Spoiler, the canine one's out. Spoiler alert, we've got um, the UV light. <laughs> sneak, we'll call it a sneak peek. A sneak peek, that's very <laughs> good. To me, it's already happened because I've had the conversation. It's fascinating. <laughs> it's, she's a very interesting woman because she's also the lady that um, proved that um, burnt foods are linked to cancer. So very accomplished lady in cancer research. Oh, really interesting. Thank you. And yeah, thank you for sharing that podcast link. So hopefully um, yeah, any interested uh, listeners can go there for any more. And uh, in terms of just, uh, is that a regular thing? Has the series ended or is that is there more episodes to come? I know you've given a sneak peek already, but um, is there some, is it a sort of series of, of episodes as well? So we're halfway through our first season at the minute. There's three episodes out and there's three more already recorded, set to come out. Um, we're hoping to do one a month, so it shouldn't be long before we have the next one out. Um, and then we are hoping to do a season two, but we haven't started recording that yet. Okay, great. Um, just slowly moving through the questions. Thank you, everyone, for posting them. That's really great. Um, so does 
someone has asked, does the fact that we have a system like the NHS help us in some way with the amount of data that um, we're available to, to get? Oh, that's a trick question. <laughs> Don't worry if um, you're not able to answer necessarily straight away. Um, we can get back to, um, we can make sure that we send out some information after the event if need be. Um, the thing is, a lot of the research that goes into producing the data that ends up in Cosmic is more from kind of like the university side of things. You think about okay. university researchers and lecturers and things like that that are doing their research behind the scenes. I'd say more of our data comes in through that stream. Um, I don't have any kind of comparative data between, you know, the information that we get in in this country versus others, because that's another key thing to remember. The data that comes into Cosmic is international. So the NHS wouldn't necessarily affect the amount of data coming into Cosmic because we're also getting information from countries that don't have the NHS. But in terms of, I guess, it comes back to does the NHS affect the amount of information we get from England would be the basis of the question. I am not 100% sure. Hmm. The only other thing I'd say on that is that we do, we do allow free access to the NHS. It's sort of an exception, but uh, we don't promote our tool as a clinical tool, even though it can be used in clinical settings. Uh, we do promote it for research purposes. Um, but in terms of how much NHS add to our data, I, I honestly don't know. So we'd have to come back to you on that. And I had a question that as well, I guess, on terms of that, that role of the curator, you say that they sort of go and find these data, the data that's being published and, and help it to put into the database. Um, I don't know if you could tell just a little flavour of that role. I don't, I don't know, of, in the sense of what, where do they, where are they looking all the time and like what makes potentially something reputable that goes into, say, cosmic and maybe something that that isn't necessarily how does how does the curator team work through that sort of problem i guess um so i know they reject quite a lot of papers so they only curate papers that are of a high quality um and often there is an issue with the, the information they find not being curatable um i think they only mentioned that if it's in an image format they can't curate it so that's a, a struggle that they have to face every day. Um, I know that they the main thing that we like to say is that they manually create the data. So they physically look at the data and extract it themselves. Um, I know there's a lot with chat, GBT and everything at the moment, but um, it just uh, helps for that extra level of accuracy and filtering out any like false information. Yeah, so, the day job okay. is kind of going through scientific articles, so the research that um, people have published once they've had these discoveries, um, pulling out the information and kind of cross-referencing it to make sure that the data is repeatable. So essentially, if one scientist says, you know, this is the case, this mutation causes cancer, that's usually not quite enough to warrant it being part of, say, the cancer mutation census, we need to make sure that it's reported at the same level of confidence by at least more than one research group. Um, and the data that they collect isn't just mutations, you know, they don't just sit there, read and go, right, that C is a T, that's wrong. There's up to 45 data points per sample that they actually curate. So that's everything from, you know, is this more common um, in males or females? Is it more common in certain ethnicities? Things like that. I think so, another yeah. thing to okay. add is that uh, there's two releases a year. So they also, although their day-to-day -day job is always curation, they'll have a focus for each release on a different type of cancer. So we've just had hematological cancers. Um, I'm not sure what the next one is, but that will vary what their day-to-day -day looks like as well. And in terms of the, the the speed, so if it was just like one paper, how long does that actually take? Or as you say, they're in kind of groups. So what what is the time frame of that curation process? 
Oh God, I have no idea. <laughs> no, I'm hard to say. I'm not actually that sure. One thing I will say is that I've heard them talk a lot about the fact that it varies per paper. Um, mm. Whilst I can't give you like an approximation, I've heard them say that some papers, you know, we talk about them being presentable and, you know, scientists have funny ways of presenting their data. Some scientists put them to so clear to read and they can just pick out the information they need and go on other times it's like reading a murder mystery novel and they have to sit there with a magnifying glass essentially and just try and decode what these scientists have tried to say and those papers just take so much longer for them but they're so I can't stress how committed these people are to what they do they're incredible scientists and they really really care about making sure that this data is perfect they'll go back and double, triple, quadruple check what they've done? That is a really cr- good question that I'm quite intrigued myself now. So I'm going to go <laughs> back and ask that one. <laughs> yeah, and I guess as well, in terms of the information will be very much global. So uh, I guess the team has to be able to analyse data from and papers from across the globe. Is that correct? Yeah, so... There's sort of a point that we can only curate what's available. Mm -hmm. So there's obviously a push globally to try and get our data more diverse. But and that's something that we're invested in as well. But we can only do that if the papers are available to publish. Um, Yeah, I don't know if you had anything else to add on that, Leonie. Yeah, it's one of those things. We have an incredibly diverse team of people working for us. and. As Zoe said, we do create papers from all over the world, but it is, you know, you've brought that up and it is actually something that's a massive concern in the cancer research and the genetic research community in general, is that there's a really disproportionate number of papers coming from kind of your wealthier countries. So you find that the people within those countries are much better represented in this data, which obviously has a trickle down effect and to how well the results of these research kind of help these people um so we curate as much as we can from different countries but again we're not the ones that are producing the research so we just kind of have to try and do as much as we can Mm, okay well thank you and uh i'm just going to make sure because i'm conscious of the time that there's a few questions left in the q a as well um so our someone's asked our germ line so obviously can the cosmic stands for catalog of somatic mutations someone's asked our germ line mutations associated with cancer also included so we don't specifically curate germ line mutations but if the ger- my understanding is if a germ line mutation is mentioned then it it gets also gets mentioned within the cosmic database um, but we don't actively curate germline mutations um, so I know the University of Cardiff they have HGMD which is the human germline mutation database and they actively curate germline mutations. Okay super and there's another one here which is just saying is there an initiative to, of creating a database of cancer mutations propagated into proteins? Um, as in curating the proteins that are the mutated proteins as well, I'm guessing what they're asking. I guess you can visualize our mutations within the 3D structure in Cosmic 3D, but I'm not sh- so sure about that question. Also, there is a level of that information in the hallmarks feature. So um, when you look into one of the genes, uh, all of the tier one genes are featured in the Hallmark section of the website and within that we have kind of like traceable information on the effects on kind of gene function which is of course the protein function in its own way and it's incredibly detailed and each bit of information has the PubMed link linking back to the original research um, so I'd say that's where we've got most of our information about proteins and um, we don't have a specific tool currently um, for just looking at the proteins and nothing else but I'd say that within Cosmic um, like Zoe said Cosmic 3D and the Hallmarks feature is where you're going to get the most information of the effects at the protein level. And I think just probably on the same um, same sort of 
vein, a few people have mentioned about are duplications and deletions also included or how you might search for them? Um, is that something you're able to comment on? Yeah, so we, my understanding is we do have that. We have within the CDC and the CMC, you can see whether it's a duplication, expansion or a deletion. Um, I can see someone's asked about looking into a specific gene and that's actually, it's quite it's quite accessible to be able to do that on Cosmic. So when you log on to the Cosmic website on the homepage, there's literally a little search bar and you can just search the name of your gene and it will come up with um, a list of different gene transcripts that we have. Um, click on whichever one you want to look into and it will take you to the kind of gene viewer where you can see histograms of kind of insertions and deletions within the gene you can see if it's been kind of registered into the hallmarks feature and a whole bunch of things great and i'm, I'm sure those sort of video tutorials will also help mm -hmm. um go through that um process mm -hmm. as well i had a question you mentioned about the versions of, uh, as well of the database and I feel like I saw earlier today that you're on version 96 or something something like that in terms of user interaction uh, and uh, user testing is that has that changed a lot since sort of how you when people have worked with uh, the database are you getting sort of feedback about what works how they're interacting with your database and does that then lead into sort of changes that are helpful for say researchers that are accessing it or pharmaceutical companies that are accessing it yeah so yeah so we have two releases each year um i believe we're on 90 or 98 coming out you only correct me if i'm wrong yeah we're on um 97 at the minute and it will be may that we see yeah. 98 come out um, yeah and with each release there's obviously more curated data but we also do try to improve the data um, I'm not sure what I could say, but I know that we do always try and listen to our users and there is a we are trying to reach out to more of our users at the moment. Um, and we're always looking to hear what people would like any improvements. So if anyone is a user and who is listening and you've got something you want, just honestly drop us a line on that Cosmic at Sanger and we're yeah. always happy to talk. Yeah, there's a big project going on behind the scenes about making our download files more accessible based on what people have said now. So, Super. And I'll just put in the website because I think uh, as well to everyone just now quickly so, so people can see mm -hmm. the database as well. Um, that's um, great. Well, I'm just conscious of the time. And so I want to make sure that I thank both uh, you uh, Leonie and Zoe for spending the evening with with us and sharing all of that lovely information. It's great. It's really sorry. Can I just say one yeah. more thing quickly? Um, I've noticed in the chat about asking for an RSS feed, and I've just searched that because I wasn't familiar with the term for the podcast. Um, but I believe what you're asking is if there's like a typed up version of it, essentially. Um, and we had taken that level of accessibility into account. So if you go into the Cosmic blog, um, the interviews are typed up there. So if you're if listening to it's an issue, then we've got a typed up version on the um, Cosmic blog for you to see. And the Cosmic blog can be found on the, the website, is that correct? Yeah, it's uh, on the homepage. Cool, super. So hopefully that link that I've just shared will get um, everybody to that page if need be. So mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, once again, thank you both for spending. No, 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 that's great. I'm really glad you cut in. It's really helpful to, to be able to make sure we point everybody to the right place. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for spending the evening uh, with everyone. And uh, likewise to everybody, um, uh, everybody watching, uh, thank you for spending your evening with us. Uh, I'm just going to quickly pop up a slide and hopefully my internet will <laughs> survive uh, doing this. Uh, I'm just getting there. This is our, when the screen share becomes, pops up. Hopefully you should be seeing that. This is our next session on the 27th of April. At the same time, 4.30, we're looking at um, mapping malaria, so genomic surveillance in more detail. Um, so uh, if you go to uh, that website down below, uh, bit.ly slash GL dash twenty seventh April. 
um, that will take you to the place where you can sign up um, for the next session. So I'll just leave that there um, for everyone. But I just want to say, yeah, a massive thank you for you all uh, joining us this evening. Um, if there are any outstanding questions, um, do send them to uh, this email here, um, and we'd be able to get them across to Zoe and Leone. If not, I think uh, Leone also has the cosmic email as well. Um, so uh, uh, feel free to also email directly them around any user user interface um, sort of questions as well. Um, but yeah, just want to say a massive thank you for to everyone for joining this evening. Thank you for having us as well. Thank you. Super. Well, I will slowly be uh, ending the, I'll stop sharing now, but I'll slowly be ending the Zoom call. Um, but if anyone has any last minute questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, but until then, we'll hopefully see uh, you next, uh, next month's genomic slide. So thank you, everyone. And uh, I hope everybody has a lovely evening.